We are live and welcome to episode 17 of the Capital Spotlight Show with a incredibly distinguished guest all the way from Houston, J.C. Clemens, of course, alongside the co-founder, Rob Beardsley of Lone Star Capital, and your guest, or your host, excuse me, Craig McGrother. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Awesome. And Thanks you're coming, yeah, absolutely. And you're in town for a couple conferences, correct? I am. I am in a few meetings and uh, just trying to get as much done while I can in the city. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for giving us some of your precious time here yeah. tonight. We've got a fun fun show here in store for the guests and, and, and people watching the show and listening, of course. And we have a fun dinner tonight after this, which is fun. So, yeah. uh, But with that said, tell us about yourself. Uh, when well, you got... Let me, let me steal the show. So yeah. this is our first time recording in the conference room of our office. So we did it special just for JC. <laughs> as you can see, we've got... Uh, the beautiful view of uh, Brookfield behind us, and then right here we've got our new maps of Texas. So we've got, you can't see it through the video, but we've got pins for properties in the portfolio, deals we've sold, deals sold. under contract. Yeah, you could swivel it if you want, but I think, yeah, go ahead and swivel it, and uh, we can also just highlight the fact that uh, we've got a Houston deal sold there. That's actually, you can't see it on the screen, but that's a partnership that flagship and Lone Star, JC and, and us did a few years ago and had a successful exit. So we'll be sure to dive into that yep. and have some good conversation. So yeah, just wanted to show off the, the new office. We're excited to be here. We're excited to host everyone at our event uh, in less than a week here as well. Big things coming around as it is conference season, as you just alluded to, and the weather is changing. It's, uh, you know, football season shaping up if you're a college or, or NFL fan. So yeah, but with that said, JC, tell us about yourself, when you got into the business, and uh, maybe why you got into real estate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so JC Clemens, flagship capital, um, based in Houston, Texas. Uh, got into real estate after graduating from the University of Texas in Austin. Started my career at HFF in Houston, uh, which is now JLL, I guess. Uh, so whenever I was at Holiday, I spent half my time on the mortgage banking side as an analyst working on deals all over the country. And once I left the mortgage banking bullpen slash desk, I uh, moved into multifamily investment sales where I was a broker for about three years and then left the brokerage side and really wanted to get into the principal side of the business. And frankly, I didn't really know kind of where I was going to go at that point. So started out at flagship really just as a loan producer. And then over the past I guess it's six and a half, almost seven years. Uh, we've essentially doubled our AUM every year since I've been there. Um, opened up an equity side of our business where we traditionally were a, a private credit shop. And, um, you know, really real estate for me uh, was a little bit of my blood. My grandfather was a residential realtor uh, in the town that I grew up in. So I kind of got my, my bad BS from him from the, <laughs> the sales side. Um, but I really think too that, you know, for somebody that, you know, real estate for me is always something to where you don't really need to have an Ivy League degree or a master's degree. For me, it's really a profession that if you work hard and really don't have to be that smart, which I'm not, uh, you can just work really hard and you can be really successful. So I think that kind of, whenever people ask why did I get into real estate, I think it was either this or I was gonna have to sell something else. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was this little bit more refined. Well, I would definitely say that the University of Texas has a better pedigree and easier uh, entryway into getting into the private equity space than the University of Arizona degree that I hold. <laughs> um, and then the, the college dropout right here, but nonetheless, um, you know, everyone's story is different and unique in that regard. So always cool to hear how you got into it. So it sounds yeah. like as, to your point, it is in your blood, which is awesome. Tell us about you know flagship capital and, and your involvement. As you yeah. said, you've been in kind of on both sides of it. And then also uh, maybe when you got to the principal side as well. Yeah, for sure. So flagship capital is a Houston-based capital provider. Historically, um, actually I'll kind of back it up even further. So the CEO, David Mintzberg, who's the head honcho that runs kind of the master of the ship for flagship, he started out his career as a general contractor with his father in the late 70s in Houston. And then his father retired, David kept going, and eventually started developing his own deals in Houston back in the early 80s. And then whenever the market completely fell out in the late 80s, early 90s, um, David ended up acquiring tens of thousands of units from the RTC, the Resolution Trust Corporation, which was on the other side of the savings and loans crisis. And so this was back when you could buy multifamily products or projects in Atlanta or in Houston for anywhere from $1,200 a unit to $3,200 a unit. And people at the time said, David, you're crazy, you're overpaying. 
um, and you couldn't finance it. It was down and dirty. Government, whenever they sold you five apartment complexes, they said, if we're going to give you these five apartment complexes, we're going to give you this retail center, this tract of land, and this office building as well, just to get everything off of their books. And so David got, I think at the end of the day, he ended up buying 15,000 units from the government. Um, and then on the other side of his portfolio, to kind of counterweight that, he ended up developing about 15,000 units of core class A. So a lot newer stuff in Las Vegas, Albuquerque, Dallas, Houston, Atlanta. And then he had this large portfolio. And then in the early 2000s, when the pension funds were buying up multifamily, kind of at a crazy rate, um, he decided to sell his entire portfolio. So him and Jared Forrester, um, who's our CFO, they ended up selling, I think it was 78 deals in a matter of six years from 2002 to 2008. So they sold essentially a deal a month um, and timed the market perfectly. Um, you know, they didn't have any crystal ball or had any idea that that was going to happen with the great financial crisis. So sold all their deals, did very well for them and for their partners and decided that they wanted to get out of the operations side of the business and get strictly into providing capital. So at that point, they transitioned from Flagship Properties Corporation into Flagship Capital Partners, uh, which is where we are today. Had the first debt fund with Heinz Global REIT based out of Houston as their partner. So that was debt fund one and two. And then there was a third debt fund that was with a large family office out of uh, Austin. And then debt fund four, which we just closed at the beginning of this year, full cycle, all the loans paid off. That was with about 20 or 30 high net worth individuals. And now we're currently deploying capital out of debt fund five. And our focus is really high, higher leverage middle market bridge debt. So kind of two to $20 million loans. Um, I think, you know, for the people that are listening out there, it's kind of we're the lenders that are, you know, in between the banks and hard money. So the banks used to be at four, we would be at six, hard money would be at 10. Today, uh, the banks are at eight, we're at 10, and hard money's at 12, 13, 14. So we're just kind of a non-recourse option with higher leverage is essentially what we focus on. And it's all middle market value add, uh, primarily multifamily, but we also do shopping centers, industrial projects, office buildings. And then in at the end of 2019, we as partners were investing kind of on a one-off basis into a lot of deals like we had done with uh, Robin Kent on Bear Creek. And it was a ton of work and we'd put out about $60 million just between us and a handful of our friends. And so we decided to formalize that process, created our first equity fund um, and we opened it up. We or it opened up for business, I think in February of 2020, closed our first deal in March of 2020. And so we really had no idea what the world was gonna look like. Uh, we sat around a table very much like this one and said, all right, do we wanna go or do we wanna wait? And the thought was, is that we're either gonna have a gun in our mouth or we're gonna be very happy that we did so. And it ended up being a very good decision. So we ended up deploying all that capital during COVID um, into 12 deals all over the country. We sold three of them when rate, rates were low, made a fortune on those deals, still have nine assets. Uh, we're still distributing to our partners out of that fund. And so that one's going really well. Um, we're currently deploying capital out of equity fund two, which is $75 million facility. Average check size is five to $6 million per deal. And we're putting out money into value add multifamily deals and some select commercial deals. Gotcha. So those are kind of the two buckets. It's private credit and LP equity. And then in that end, are you looking for JV economics yes. on that? Yes. Okay, Sorry, gotcha. Yeah. It's not yeah. PREF. It's not MES. It's we're Perry Pursue with all other money in the deal. Right. So and for the you know that five to six million dollar equity right now, are you looking to you know be the majority check writer? Where do you like to sit, or does not really matter to you as long as it's a good deal? Yeah, it doesn't really matter. And we're for how expensive things have gotten. You know, five million dollars really doesn't get you that far. Um, and so what typically happens is we're either the first one ones in or the last ones in. So say it's a $15 million raise, uh, we'll be the first 5 million and then they'll raise the rest retail or they'll raise 11 and they'll need six and we'll come in at the end. Um, but for us really, what we have found out is that we're really just solving a problem for the general partners. Like typically our sponsors can go raise the money. It's just going to take them 60 days and they're going to have to do it in 50,000, 100,000, $200,000 clips. We can solve a pretty big time issue for them by just cutting them a check right then and there. Um, and it's been pretty attractive to the people that we've invested with. Incredible. And so did you get on the principal side on this in 2020, would you say? Because that's when yeah. that fun. Okay, so that's when you started deploying equity from that from that correct. side of it as opposed to the debt side, correct? correct. Okay, correct. awesome. Yeah. So I, yeah, I think I've been a partner at the firm for two or three years now. Um, 
which is great, but as partners know, comes with a lot of strings attached as well, you know, so it's uh, being on the other side of the ledger, especially coming from the brokerage side of the world, you know, when you're a broker, every deal's the greatest damn deal ever. Uh, oh, I can tell you all about that because <laughs> I, yeah, you know, yeah. It, uh, you know, you don't care. You just need it to, you need volatility and you need transactions. Yeah. Uh, and on the principal side, I mean, you have to live with this stuff. Um, and so it was a very interesting shift in the way that I thought about deals coming from the brokerage side to the principal side. But it is nice because, you know, 95% of my deals come from brokers, you know, because that's my network. And so it's really nice um, kind of having that stable of people and the deal flow that comes from. Yeah, and when you're a brokerage, velocity is your best friend. For sure. Yeah, for sure. So you said a lot of interesting things that I think give color to where you guys are today as far as your experience and the way you look at deals. Yeah. Firstly, David's background as an operator yeah. and seeing a lot. Obviously, the longer you're in the game, you see cycles. I think spending some time today talking about, and selfishly, I think for us, truly beneficial topics about how to handle what's happening right now, yeah. how to handle what's coming up ahead, what are the opportunities that we should take advantage of. So that's a super interesting angle. And then the angle from the fact that you guys provide debt and equity, I think that's unique because you guys don't look at a deal from one way. You, yeah. don't, you don't have a hammer in your hand and everything's a nail. You can look at a deal, and I, I know we've had these conversations before where a deal might not look quite right for you on the equity side, So yeah. then, but it's a fit on the debt side. So I think it's it would be interesting to maybe we'll just start on that topic. I think yeah. it's a little simpler just to say how you guys look at a deal, both from the debt side and the equity yeah. side, and how that informs each uh, bucket. Yeah. So you know, a lot of times people, like you said, will just bring us a deal and say, "We need money." You know, it can be as the lender or it can be as the equity provider. Um, you know, it's really two different groups of investors, and it's two different types of risk. You know, and so on the private credit kind of debt side, whenever we look at every asset that we're potentially going to provide a loan on, I'll give an example of a couple live ones that we have right now, we're really looking at the basis of the project. Um, you know, because with a loan, you're in a better risk position because you have the first lien on the property. So if something goes south, you know, in theory, you can get it back and operate the deal and sell it and get your money back. Um, but your upside is also capped. And so for us, we're really looking on both debt and equity, we're looking at quality of sponsorship. And on the debt side, we really need to understand the risk associated with the real estate, you know, because we're really focused on more downside risk there because our upside risk is essentially capped, right? So debt deals, you can underwrite them to a certain way to where you're like, I really believe in the general partner. I think they're putting a good amount into this deal. And I think inherently you can take a little bit more risk on the debt side um, from a real estate perspective, just because of your position. You know, because if you think about it, at the end of the day, the main focus of our debt fund is providing first lien financing for somebody. And so, at the end of the day, our basis is in theory twenty to thirty percent below what they're buying it for. And that's just kind of how it sits. So, I mean, with that, would you rather take sponsor risk or real estate risk? Because if you're sponsor, if you're at a good basis and you're sponsor screws it up, well, it's fine. You've got, you can yeah. take over the deal or are you making the argument that you're okay pushing the envelope on the real estate yeah. side of things as far real as... Real estate for sure. Yeah. I don't think I, after being in this business as long as I have, I'd much rather be in a bad deal with a good sponsor than in a good deal with a bad sponsor. Yeah. My question to that actually was going to be, you know, what do you look for in a sponsor when yeah. you, when you kind of audit that process? Cause I'm sure people pitch you all de deals all yeah. day long. You get spammed. I'm sure if you checked your spam again in drunk mail, you're going to have more <laughs> deals flooded in. And I'm sure you see all sorts of silly uh, underwriting and then all sorts of silly Dropbox, link, uh, Dropbox links with kind of about us as a firm and stuff. So out of curiosity, you know, what do you look for and what do you say yes to? Yeah. Uh, I mean, 90% of the time, like you said, it's a no. Uh, just because of circumstance or situation or kind of who the, the person is because there's very, you know, it's very rare that we find somebody that we can't make some calls and kind of figure out who they are and what they're doing. Um, but really what I'm looking for, I think on the debt side, is somebody that is really an up and coming sponsor. You know, somebody who's really got a track record, but doesn't have to be a deep one. You know, a lot of times our borrowers are people that were top lieutenants at big acquisition shops and now they're off doing their own thing because, and y'all definitely know this, like at these large organizations, the guys at the top that everybody wants to do deals with probably spend less than 2% of their time on it's the people that are kind of two or three rings below them that are negotiating the contracts, doing the day-to-day -day operations, you know, dealing with the general contractors. Um, and so when those people split off, their biggest need is capital. 
they've got the experience, they've got the crews, they've got the deal flow. And so I, we have found at Flagship found a lot of success on people that are kind of stemming out of some larger organizations. Um, and also a lot of people that have just really skid their knees on their first couple of deals and now are ready to kind of get into the big leagues. Um, and so that's where a lot of our sponsors, I always tell people we do people's deals kind of two through 10. You know, we're never gonna do somebody's first deal. And once you've done your 10th deal, you typically have some real sexy partner that's got cheap money and, you know, some programmatic relationship with the bank or something like that. So I think it's people that are, you know, really putting everything they've got into the deals. And it's not just deal number 35 for somebody, uh, because we've learned that when people are putting in their own capital and they don't have a large portfolio and they really need these things to work, uh, they tend to spend a lot more time on them. Let me take this to a very fun topic, because what you're preaching is basically you take tenacity and buy-in over experience. For sure. That's kind of what you're painting the picture of, which I think it makes sense. And it's a great strategy as a capital provider because you're getting alpha by taking manager risk. For sure. So, and that's that's reputational risk because if something goes wrong, people, your investors could go, why did you bet on that newbie? For sure. Right? So you're taking reputational risk and all that stuff. But I, I agree with that. I think it makes a ton of sense because we were in that exact yeah. position and we felt very confident that, hey, this real estate stuff's not rocket science. If we just put our all into it, we'll be successful. And thankfully, you know, we, we've done just that. But let me, sorry to steal your thunder here, but the topic that I would love to talk about, and I know we've talked about this before yeah. on stage actually, is about co-invest. Yeah. Because what you're talking about is you want an emerging sponsor, they're going to put their heart and soul into it, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to put their two million bucks of personal equity into it yeah. or 10% of the required equity because they simply don't have that. So how does flagship, what's flagship's position on that? And I mean, we've talked about this on our, on this podcast a bunch because it's, it's frustrating. We've talked, we've bumped our heads with various capital partners who are very strict and don't really want to work around the 10% sponsor co-invest issue. Yeah, it's a great topic. And we've had to bridge that gap with, I'd probably say 30 to 40% of the people that we've given money to either on the debt or equity side. And y'all know this because y'all are out there in the streets buying deals on a large scale regularly. Um, and these people that operate these larger funds, you know, pension funds, institutional investment groups, like they're a little bit detached from reality, in my opinion, on exactly, you know, what people that are doing deals can and can't do. So if you want to buy three or four deals a year and you have to invest 10 to 15 or 20 percent of your net equity into each deal, that could be two million dollars in cash. And I don't know very many real estate guys, even the big guys that have two million dollars in cash laying around. It's just it's just, uh, it's just not logical. I mean, no, they, you can't do it. Yeah. And so what we found is that you know there's kind of two or three different solutions. You know, one is really the true friends and family solution. So I'm gonna make if you say a hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money to me, I'm, you're gonna send me your personal financials and I'm gonna confirm that. You know, that's step one. Um, and hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money, but I don't want to, you know, see, you know, For sure. six million dollars in bonds, you know, that are just sitting there. Um, and then, you know, one thing that we've always said is that if it's somebody you're going to see at Thanksgiving, you know, we will typically, you know, allow that to be included into the sponsor contribution. Because, I mean, if I've got family members, very close family members invested in our fund, and I'm much more scared about losing their money than I am losing mine. Uh, did, you, did you write that down? Make sure, <laughs> make sure to invite everyone we know to Thanksgiving. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do. My mom's an amazing uh, chef, and I'll also she it. she also makes two turkeys every Thanksgiving for extra leftovers for the sandwiches after. So we're fully sorted on that front. Yeah, it. yeah. And then the you know the other one's a co GP. You know we've seen a lot of that stuff, and I think that people don't give enough credit to the co GP side of things because really these people that are starting out, they're going to be doing all the work. Again, what they need is capital. And so having somebody that can sit there and sign on the loan, because we have, do have strict mandates on uh, net worth and liquidity on the debt side. That's just a, we have to have that. Um, but on the equity side, I think giving a little bit as an emerging sponsor on the front end to help build your career is worth it in the long run. You know, so if you have to bring in some rich guy and say, hey, I'm going to give you 50% of the back end if you, you know, help me out on this deal, hopefully that's deal one of 10 and you don't need them on the next nine. You know, and I just think that, you know, a lot of people, whenever we say, hey, like we recently had to kill a deal, um, love the deal, love the guys, but they just could not give us a straight answer on how much money they were putting in the deal. 
we just asked him directly, how much you put in? And it was, it was 75 grand. Then it was 50. And then it was like, oh, that's not net of the act fee. Oh, it's this. And then it ended up just, if they just would have told us they wouldn't put any money in the deal, then we could have stopped ever, the process and not wasted everybody's time. But I think that's the one thing that gets us the most is transparency on that issue because people are relatively embarrassed about it, which, I mean, we're, I always tell people, this is a partnership, not a pirate ship. You know, it's right. so like literally, we're getting, like, I'm going to know everything about you. I'm about to run a background check on you. Like, I'm going to know everything that you've ever done. Well, I'll find out one way or another. I'm going to find so, out yeah, one, exactly. so just tell me, yeah. you know? And so it's just interesting how people dance on the issue. And if you don't have enough money to put fifty or $100,000 into a deal, you should not be buying real estate, right. you know? But if that is 10% of your net worth, I'm telling you, you're going to focus on this deal so much harder than a guy who's worth $20 million that's putting $400,000 into the deal. It's just, it's a fact. Uh, it's all relative. Yeah. yeah. And to your point, I think there is a bit of embarrassment that people sure. do feel because of there's this pressure in the industry that you have to invest 10%. And if you don't, your interests are not aligned and you must be a bad sponsor or something like that. And I think the reality is if you look around, like you said, all these deals that are getting done, it's not getting done by the sponsor putting in a million, two million, three million. That's just, that's not how the game works. No. That and especially the guys who have it, they're definitely not doing. No. You know, and so I think there is this kind of just this misconception in the market that if you really boil it down and somebody says, oh, I'm doing a true 70-30, like they've got some fund that they're a 0.0001% owner in, and that fund is putting in the 30%. You know, so like if you really boil it down, most sponsors are putting in the same amount of capital on deals. If you really kind of look behind the scenes. Um, so that's one thing that we really focus on. I want to go, and we got a little script over here, but I want to go off yeah. script just a little bit because you reminded me when you said that you're going to know everything about yeah. the sponsor. When we did our first deal together and you guys were doing due diligence on us, we were on the phone every night, yeah. 8 p.m., long time, and you're asking for this and crunching these numbers and let's work through these analyses. And I learned a ton going through that. So I always look back at that and go, yeah, that was a super helpful partnership because that leveled up our game from an underwriting perspective, working with a partner, being transparent, and, and then on the asset management side, which we can get into yeah, as yeah. well. Uh, so I just you know appreciate that. Sure. And, I, and it is true. You do dig in to the point where there is no point in not being transparent because someone's going to find out sooner or later. 100%. So I have a question kind of circling back to, you know, what you look for. Do you look at anything differently from a debt and equity perspective when you do provide capital on either side of the spectrum with a sponsor? Um, no, I mean, I think at the end of the day, our sponsor quality doesn't vary between deals. We've just, again, we've been in this business long enough and my two managing partners have been in it so long to where like they've been in so many good and bad deals. and been sued and sued and you know people have died and it is just like all this kind of stuff to where like they've seen every situation and at the end of the day it, the sponsorship quality just cannot change um, you know and quality again is a relative term from a net worth and liquidity standpoint to an experience standpoint to just a, you know an ethics standpoint uh, but I do think again that it, you know just given to where we sit that we're not I wouldn't even say go farther down the risk curve I think that we would be willing to get more creative on the debt side just because in theory, you're you know relatively hedged both on the bottom and the top, right? You're not going to make a fortune on a debt deal, but you know it's it's very hard if you do your due diligence to lose a ton of money on a on a loan if you're really digging in. Just given the way that we underwrite deals, I underwrite an Armageddon scenario, and there's a pathway to us getting our money back uh, right. on the debt side and on the equity side. You know, you're trying to hit doubles, triples, and home runs. You know, and you can be wiped out by the lender in a second. So that one on the real estate side, I think we're not willing to get as creative as we would be on the debt side, just given our, our position as a first lien holder as an LPI. Right, right. And with that said, out of curiosity, do you prefer deploying equity on the debt or on the uh, capital principal side? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, it's really just your risk appetite and it's a tax thing too, because on the debt side, it's a lot of normal income just because you're getting checks every month. And so some investors love getting mailbox checks, you know, like that. But some uber high net worth people that I know y'all deal with, all they care about is taxes. They really don't even like, a lot of them don't even care like if they make money. They All they care about is their taxes. Yeah. Um, it, can be, so, it can be slightly neurotic with some people as well, funny no, enough. No, I mean, it's yeah. just like literally, that's what some yeah. people get out of bed in the morning to do, is yeah. focus on how to not give the government any money. Which is um, a silly a silly game to play, but I understand because no, I don't want to pay those either. So. No, for sure, yeah. for sure. So, I mean, I think we're really agnostic as to which side that we put it out on. At different times, we have different, 
uh, amounts allocated. So obviously, if we're sitting on a bunch of you know private credit capital, we'll want to push that harder. Um, and then if we're sitting on a ton of equity capital, we'll want to push that harder. But it's really you know the equity is typically pretty consistent given any kind of market landscape. Um, but the debt is typically a little more cyclical. So our debt will be super hot for nine months, and then it'll kind of calm for a little bit. And that just all depends on where the banks are, where the, you know, bridge guys down the street are, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. You move kind of with where the market is and then, Correct. you know, exactly. It's, it's a, a slight lag in that regard. Correct. Right. Correct. Okay. So it's not as fluid as the equity side. Very cool. So switching gears slightly, uh, how did you two meet and what year did you meet? So I'm always fascinated because that deal was very early on in Rob's career. Yeah. Uh, so maybe just tell me about how you guys two met, how you became acquainted. Was it a cold email? Was it a meetup in Houston? You've met so many people from so many kind of different avenues. So I'm always fascinated to know how these capital relationships are always formed. I actually have no idea how we met. I mean, hopefully you do. <laughs> I mean, it was so long ago. I really, I really can't remember. He's a pretty good memory, so and well, I have an incredible one. No, so. I don't know. I don't think I have a good memory, but I do remember this. And actually, it comes full circle because we were actually right here in this room having a conference call with Ed Nwakity. Mm. <laughs> Got it. So we were on the call with Ed today, and he previously was a Cushman broker. That's right. And so he invited me to his Cushman event that he was putting on in Houston. So I happened, so I showed up, you happened to be there and that's where we met. It was just as simple as a little Houston meetup. Yeah. And it was, it was the start of what became a great relationship. So it's funny to show you the proof. People always ask me, how do you meet equity and how do you build relationships? What's the secret? And there is no secret, just be in the right rooms, show up and you never know who you're going to meet, but eventually you do. No, I mean, and that's it's so our CEO David Vinsberg always says he goes, I can guarantee you're going to meet nobody if you don't go. You know, it's so funny. I actually <laughs> that's was, the one thing I can guarantee you. And this is uh, for everyone listening, watching, and consuming this. I actually was giving you praise about this yesterday, as a matter of fact. It's like, you know, Rob, one thing you've done an incredible job, actually two days ago, I take that back. I was like, one thing you've done an incredible job with is always been texting, meeting up, going to events, saying yes to things, putting yourself out there, going to random events where you might meet no one, and this might be a huge waste of time, or you might meet the next equity provider that could really propel your business into something incredibly large. So it just goes to show, you know, I have struggled with this in the past before, but I'm working on this. Sometimes being a yes man is very, very uh, powerful and useful. It can feel draining. It can feel uh, like it won't lead to anything, but you really just never know. So good on you for that. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, and I'll just add to the story because though I think the interesting point of the story is how young I was and how early in our career we were. And that was, that, that was the tricky part. And like, Craig mentioned we partner on our second deal together. Yeah. Which people always say say that, oh, don't you have to have a long track record to partner with somebody big and sophisticated and how does that work? And I think, yeah, obviously you guys do prefer somebody with some more yeah. experience, but the second deal. There you go. You just but said I do you do remember I do remember that part of the story, which was we told you no on the first deal. And you know, you we literally said, go and go ahead, cowboy, go get it and call us back whenever you've done it. And then he called us back and you had done it, you know, and we were like, all right, shit, you know, maybe he knows what he's doing. And then we went and walked it, did it. And we were like, man, they really, you know, put their time and effort into this deal. And so it was really you taking rejection, I think. And I bet you probably had a little grudge on your shoulder and kind of coming back and being like, all right, I'm going to go prove those guys, you know, that we well, did. Here, here's the grudge. This is the funniest part. And I, I'm sure you, you've, I'm sure I've told you this before, but Kent and I had that super long meeting with you guys in your office with your two big top dog partners, right? We're just getting grilled. (laughs) Uh, Like, who's this young, who are these guys from New York trying to come and do deals in Houston? Who's this kid that, uh, you know, can't grow a beard, right? And we're going through and we're getting grilled and and we thought, yeah, you know, this is going well. If they're doing this long of a grilling session, they must want to do it, right? Uh, But then in the end, you guys... uh, you guys pass on it, but I think the the funny part that Kent and I always laugh at laugh at is okay. We, we walk out, and your assistant at the front, uh, secretary at the front, yeah, yeah. validates our parking, and we're we're leaving the parking lot, and we went, wow, we just got that two hour grilling done, and then we put the parking validation sticker in, and it comes out and it says, okay, you only got validated for an hour. You have to pay for the extra hour of grilling. <laughs> I love it. 
I love it. That's We're very so, frugal at flagship. Right, right, right. right. Well, yeah, listen, yeah. It, yeah, no. the, right. the reality is that, you know, in the other income section of that uh, office property, they have to make their money some way, yeah. one way or another. So you got to make sure you fulfill that bucket, right? right. So I'm happy that That's the right. parking meter uh, was able to hit that part of the uh, business model there for whoever that owned that office. <laughs> so right. awesome. So did you only show then on your end, Rob, two deals to the, their group prior to them saying yes? No, so we, we, had, uh, we had needed to get... Cranbrook Forest on. That was our first deal. And we uh, we showed flagship that deal. And as I always say and tell everybody, the first deal you show anyone, they're going to say no. Yep. How, how can they not, right? They'd, be, they'd feel like fools inside if they say yes to the first deal that you show them. So Let alone when it's also a emerging sponsor with zero dollars of AUM that are in New York going to Houston. Yeah. A lot. It's a lot. So, but we were in desperate need. So we're out there hustling and trying to make it happen. And so we went through a very valuable process of due diligence, getting to know each other, seeing yep. the deal, and going through that process to then get the no, which is fine. And then it was only the next deal, Verandas at Bear Creek, which is the deal that we partnered on, and, and then had a full cycle on, which is fantastic. Yeah, you can hold it. So how long then from that point was the gap between the no on the first opportunity to the yes on the second? Is it nine months? Yeah, it was about sure. nine months. Yeah. yeah. So. We, because y'all had to clean out the tenant base, kind of get the financials done. Y'all done a lot of the capex stuff on the exterior, and we went and walked that deal again before we even saw the next one. We were right. like, "No way, these guys did that." Because we saw the numbers, you know. I looked at the financials, and I was like, "No way," you know. And so we had to go and see it for ourselves. And then after that, we drove down the street and went and saw Miranda's. Yeah, exactly. They, they basically call. They told us, "Hey, we like you guys. We like the plan, but." It's a pass. Why don't you go prove us wrong and call us back in six yeah. months, right? right? And that's so that's what we went and did. Uh, and, and, and by the way, that property specifically, I spoke with a potential new investor that we had, uh, and he actually mentioned that he lived by the first property that you did, and he was because he you know was very aware of the crime issues near it yep. and heard from several neighbors before because he grew up there how the property totally changed and he went back and was like oh my god they're right this neighborhood is actually totally transformed because of this property there so really crazy the impact on the community that these properties can have when they do get cleaned up which yep. is just a, a very important story outside of of course a nice juicy irr of course so, yeah. which we had Yes, yes. So I guess then switching into why you said yes. So why did you say yes to Lone Star Capital and yes to the deal? Because obviously there's not unlimited capital, of course, and yeah. you have opportunity cost risks. So walk us through that and maybe why you felt comfortable and I guess we're persuaded uh, by Kent and Rob to, to say yes on opportunity number two. Yeah, uh, so at the end of the day, I think the vast majority of success in real estate is is really on the going in by, you know. It, we luckily being in Houston, whenever they got that deal under contract, we knew the seller who was kind of a prolific seller that we knew had no idea how to operate deals. <laughs> um, and so we knew that there was meat on the bone. Um, two, I, unfortunately, I probably know too much about Houston because I sold, you know, a ton of deals there before I started investing in them. And so I just say no to so many things whenever I see these new valuations. Um, and then we saw the number that you had it under contract for, and we were like, uh, you know, everybody kind of looked at each other, and we were like, uh, you know, yeah. like the gut check was good. And so at that point, and then we were like, all right, well, if they can show us that they did what they said they were going to do, which Cranbrook was not a walk in the park at all. Like, we know that area much better than Rob and Kent do and knew how, <laughs> how hard of a lift that was going to be. But the deal, second deal that they showed us was in a pretty good neighborhood. Very working class, I think probably a C plus to a B minus neighborhood in a quality C minus deal. Um, you know, large Hispanic, you know, kind of tenant base, good jobs, tons of retail, no new supply. Uh, you know, just had... It was really kind of the deal was the first like getting over the hump. So if like if people always ask like why did they say yes, it's because the real estate was good. You know, I think you know that's first and foremost to so kind of get the conversation quality, going. Quality basis trumps a lot of things. It really does. Yeah, solve a lot of issues. Right? And then once we saw them do a good job on a much harder asset, we were like, all right, this is going to be a much lighter lift on a much nicer asset in a better part of town with experience. With yeah. the, and, and so it just kind of it checked a lot of the boxes. Uh, because I still like that deal. I mean, y'all still own in the area, don't you? Yeah, so we yeah. sold that deal, but then we bought two Across deals right down yeah, the street. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I just think that one was really started with the real estate, which I think that's the hardest part 
especially these days, is just getting the damn thing under contract. Um, and so it's like, you know, if you can get the deal under contract for a good number, that's literally a lot of the battle. And then structure, deal, I mean, we're smart enough real estate people to where like, we're not gonna lose a deal over marginal dollars. Like, I mean, sure, everybody loves to negotiate, but it's not like we're just gonna beat people up to get stuff done. Well, and here's the crazy thing, because I defend, quote, I mean, you guys are middle market mm -hmm. capital, but I just lump you guys in with institutional equity. Yeah. And I'm always defending institutional equity and family offices because everyone kind of in the more retail space always says they're vultures, they boss you around, they take advantage of you, they'll walk away at the last second or right before the deal closes, they'll retrade the terms. And I'm always defending groups like you guys and saying, no, this is a very small community. Reputation yeah. is everything. You guys won't be able to put out equity if you do that a couple times. No. So, and it's you, not a bad, it's not a good use of our time. No. Like I don't have time to sit there and jack around with people. And screw, <laughs> screw someone over on one deal to never for, do a deal for again. For a hundred grand or a basis point or like here or there. I mean, it's it's literally like, that's not good, good use of my time. No. Bad karma as well. Yeah. yeah. The, and so the example that we have here is here we were, second deal, very desperate, needed the capital to close. And I remember being on the call with you and David, and David said, yeah, you know, in this situation, I could probably rip your heart out and charge you whatever I want, <laughs> but I'm not gonna because I wanna have a great relationship with you guys and I wanna do lots of deals. So that's the exact opposite of the reputation that some people have or, or idea that people have about yeah you know, scary institutional capital. So I think that's a really good lesson for people to hear. Well, I think it's the, really important too, because David used to be you. You know, I think that's really important because there's a lot of guys that are in these fancy office buildings here in New York that have never seen a class C multifamily deal. You know, they don't get how these things work. And I think David coming from the, you know, general partner, general contractor side, like he used to like live and die these things. And so he knows how hard it is to get stuff done and get rolling. I think that's what makes us good partners really at the end of the day is like, we understand like what it's like to start out. We understand what it's like to have the leasing agent steal money from you and the you know GC to never show up because there's not an honest GC in the country. You know, it's just like it, all these little things that can just kind of you know death by a thousand paper cuts on a deal, and it can just absolutely beat you up mentally. Like we did, you know, and that goes the same thing with fees and structure. Like you know, some guys are like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, it's the whole you know. Uh, investment banking model to where like guys show their flags by how hard they beat people up on deals like at the end of the day if the sponsor has no path to making a bunch of money they are totally not going to give a shit about your deal i mean it, it doesn't make any sense conceptually so if there's not any cheese at the end the rats can stop eating you know and so it's just like i don't know i've never got that concept yeah it's just interesting because it's just how you want to conduct yourself and that's just n by no means how i would like to think the world would want to work and who would i ever want to work with and who we would long term want to create you know a programmatic partnership with but funny enough on that on this premise we actually got asked in new orleans this past weekend hey you know institutional equity isn't it scary don't they kind of bend you over last minute and to that point the answer is i guess perhaps but no one that you'd actually want to do partnerships with and no one who actually has a reputable name in the space would actually do that yeah i totally agree i mean it's we know everybody that shows up on the term sheets against us and literally on the on the lending side it's more prevalent because there's a lot of times to where i tell people i'm like you don't have to take my deal but you sure as hell don't want to take their deal and they call me back two or three years later and they're like it was bad yeah and i'm like dude i told you <laughs> like so how do you think being doing brokerage has actually really suited you to be an expert in this side right now? Do you think that really gives you a competitive advantage over other equity providers, specifically in the Houston market? Because you obviously invest outside of Houston, correct, yeah. at the flagship. But as it, it pertains to Houston, maybe other you know local markets, um, has that been, you know, would you say, an X factor that you provide and bring to flagship? For sure. I mean, it, and luckily for me, it wasn't. So back in the early days of HFF, I mean, it was literally like the top shop, really tight knit group. And so, I mean, I still, I've done four deals with ex HFF guys that were guys and girls that were analysts whenever I was there, one based in New York, one in LA, one in Chicago, one in Miami. So, I mean, we were all in the trenches together and now every single person is still at JLL, you know, heavy hitter broker or they're out buying their own deals. And so I think it kind of gave me an inherent network nationwide which is really important. Um, and I think it just makes you so tough being a broker. Like, I mean, 
I don't know. I kind of become you know apathetic to everything. I mean, literally, like deal dies. I'm like, eh. yeah, you know, deal deal yeah. closes. At, like you can't get excited about commission checks or losing deals, or you'll just completely burn out. And so I think it just like it taught me how to be tough, and it really taught me like that. There's these set of rules that everybody thinks everybody kind of abides by, but then there's like all this area over here where a lot of people operate. And I kind of made a decision, because there's a lot of brokers that make a lot of money doing stuff over here, but I always wanted to stay kind of in the middle of the lane. And you know, there's stuff now that I've, like relationships that I still have from my old brokerage days to where like, I thought that person would never call me back, never do a deal with them, and 10 years later, we're in a deal together. You know, and so I think it was really just kind of the, the tortoise approach of just kind of, you keep doing the same thing, stay ethical, don't be an asshole just to be one. Like really the brokerage side, that once you make it on the brokerage side, which are very few people who are really successful brokers in this country, uh, it's because they just totally grind constantly, but they have like a very strict parameters that they stay within. And I kind of emulated that on the equity side and brought it over to a shop that was, you know, really looking for something to kind of be a tinder box to kind of get it going. Um, and so it's been really nice because there's a ton of experience. So they taught me how to be a principal, but I brought the kind of, you know, intensity of the brokerage shop. And so I think it really kind of helped, you know, cover both sides. Yeah. I mean, getting used to not knowing what the heck you're going to make at all and knowing that things are going to fall apart or could fall apart and not getting too high and too low in the space probably makes you very well suited. And also realizing what rates can do, you know, for the oh, yeah. plus or minus of what the year can do from an income perspective is well, really, really big. I mean, I can literally go down and talk to like the meanest New York broker and they're mean and like totally not pays me. And we yeah. get a deal done together. Yeah. And then I can go talk with some honky in Houston and get another. I mean, it's just like literally having dealt with so many people in the brokerage world, like literally I can walk into any demographic type person's office and I can get a deal done. Yeah, you, you become a chameleon very quickly For if you're sure. in the space. Yeah. yeah. So on the deal that we did do, switching back to that, uh, we did pretty well uh, on that one, if I'm not mistaken. I believe there was a pretty nice number yeah. uh, from an equity perspective that was created on that one, if you want to share. And that was spoken about or was was mentioned at the BEC Fireside Chat. Um, if you guys want to get into maybe some of the details in the IRR. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing for me, and you'll know the numbers better than me because that was many, many deals ago, um, is that I think the COVID navigation was really the biggest part of that yes. deal because nobody knew what they were doing. I don't care if you're the most experienced operator in the country or if you're just starting out. And so us being able to work collaboratively with y'all and the lender and so the lender was kind of playing some hardball and I know David gave you some pointers on how to kind of throw that back in their face. Um, and so it was just really important that we had, there wasn't a lot of ego involved in that because it was a space that Sure, David's been operating deals for 40 years, so he knows how to do that, but he doesn't know how to deal with the pandemic. You know, and y'all, probably for the better, you know, didn't have as much historical experience on the operation side, so you're, we were all willing to kind of get creative together, and I think that's literally what made that deal work, because we, we threaded, y'all threaded that needle perfectly on that one. It was really, really a good deal, in tough times. Yeah, well, thank you for that, and we, yeah, COVID was a very interesting portion of that deal. We took it very seriously. I mean, why wouldn't you? Right early on in, in that yeah. period of time, nobody knew if people would pay rent. They didn't know if the world was going to end, jobs. You're going to die from a You're going to die. Yeah. So we took it very seriously and we decided that our number one objective would be to refi out of the bridge loan. Yep. And so we had a couple of bridge loans at that point in the portfolio. We refied out of all of them. So at that point we had no bridge loans uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, however, and of course, you know, you don't have a crystal ball and, yeah. you know, you try to do things right, whether it be fixing your rate or floating your rate. And sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. In this case, we opted to float the rate. Uh, and that just had, that ended up being a very good yeah. decision because rates floated lower and stayed lower. And it gave us the flexibility to, in the end, sell the deal, which is what, in the end, we wanted. We wanted to get a win on the board. We wanted to get you guys your money back and give you a great return. And uh, we we did just that. I mean, we held the deal for 34 months. Uh, it was a 36% net IRR to investor at the general LP level and a 2.24x equity multiple. But for you guys, you guys had a kicker because yeah. you came in with the majority of the equity and everything. So I'm I'm guessing you guys. I don't I don't know your numbers, but I'm guessing you came in at almost a 3x or something like that. Yeah, it was just I think it was below that. It was like a 278, if I remember correctly, which is phenomenal in any circumstance. But over that. 
that period of time in the world and, and specifically in real estate and even more specifically in multifamily, it was just, it was a total home run. Yeah. So we enjoyed our, our partnership there a yeah. ton and that was a sweet win. And the we guys definitely still talk about you. A lot of our <laughs> private guys do. Um, so they're like, what are y'all doing another deal with those guys out of New York? And he was like, that, that kid, what was his name? It was like, it was not a kid. His name's Rob. You know, like, <laughs> these guys are 70 years old. Oh, you know, it's, they, they're the just, best. They, they, they're, you best sat down with two of the tougher ones. Um, I cannot wait to hopefully, I, I love that energy and that, oh, that type of people. So I would love hopefully next time in Houston, if we get a deal done together to all uh, get dinner with some of the good old boys, I'm uh, sure. There's, yeah, there's Cause I imagine of, they are good old boys. So they are. They are. I think. I think a little bit. I've reprogrammed Craig a little bit to appreciate the ballbusters. Yeah. Because when Craig uh, uh, first came on over a year ago, uh, you know, we'd have some tough conversations yeah. with some straightforward guys saying, "Oh, well, you guys don't have certain experience," or "I think you guys are doing this wrong," or whatever. Right. And. I, I kind of I like it. I kind of yeah. kind of gets me going, and like you said, being able to walk into a room and get a deal done with anybody, I think that is a super fun challenge. So uh, that's kind of a little side point. I think. Well, Craig started I, listen, to... I I do genuinely enjoy sparring in that regard. There's just some <laughs> a level of respect though that I feel I should be treated with. Maybe that's my my ego getting in the way, uh, but I have no issue. I'm, I have very thick skin. It, it's yeah. very 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 challenging. It'd be very hard to phase me in that in many respects. I would say. Yeah. So with that being said, I think like we were talking about in yeah. Houston a couple of weeks ago, uh, we're very excited about what's to come and get going on some great opportunities that are for sure coming our way. Yeah. Which, speaking of which, let's talk about the different types of rescue capital that are available in the market. Do you play in that space at all? Have you raised funds for rescue capital? And is rescue set capital something that you at Flagship would personally want to distribute to specific, specific deals and sponsors? Yeah. Um, so I think that's a, a very broad term, rescue yes. capital. Uh, so Maybe where you'd like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the answer is sure. You know, we, we'd be happy to provide rescue capital. I don't think that the generation of people that are in need of rescue capital really understand what rescue capital is from the traditional standpoint. Um, rescue capital, in the eyes of flagship, is your last stop before the lender forecloses on you and you lose the deal. Uh, it is not a fun position to be in. It is not a conversational, you know, type, you know, equity investment. It's a, we're going to come in and it's, it's essentially going to be a takeover. You know, we are going to take over the project for you and you're going to go over here. Uh, and we're not going to like, you know, write you out of the deal, but we're going to, the money's going to be super expensive. We will take absolute management control and we're only going to invest in the deal if we think we can ride the ship and makes a very, very hefty return on the transaction for the risk that we're taking. Uh, you know, I think what a lot of people think rescue capital is, is somebody pumping in, you know, two or three billion bucks in the project to kind of get it over the hump. And then everybody kind of like has fun at the end kind of thing. And that's just, that's just not, that's not what rescue capital is. It's not rainbows and sunshines. No, and, it, and, yeah. and, and a lot of, and why I say this generation is that this generation has never had a, a black swan event such as interest rates rising or, you know, something that has really had them look around the table with their investors and say, do we think, do we believe in this project enough to where we want to own it in five years? If so, we need to inject capital into this deal. That can either come from you or it can come from somebody else. If it comes from somebody else, your portion is going to go down like this and their portion is going to get paid first before your portion goes back up to this. Well, and, me, and I, I want to make a comment right now, please. So if for everyone who's listening right now, who has in their checker, uh, have you ever had a capital call? That's one thing, but there's this new phrasing and rebranding of a capital call right now, which is known as a member loan. A member loan and a capital call are the same thing. This is just a PSA to everyone out there. Uh, and if you want to add yeah, on you're, that. You're yeah, you're stealing my thunder, okay, but no, no, that's, no, no, you're totally. I just was so quick, it was uh, on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, so we've, we've been having conversations with people, and I think a lot of people are in the denial phase right now for sure. where they're thinking, well, my deal is in trouble, but surely I can just get some rescue capital yeah. and then my deal is saved. Right. But all of, and it is what it is, whether it be a capital call that dilutes the equity explicitly, or it be a partner mem loan, partner member loan, loan, member loan yeah. manager advance or third party Correct. loan or preferred equity. If it's coming in at a rate of 15% plus, it's dilutive to the existing equity, for sure. especially when you consider the impairment of the equity, the impaired situation the equity is currently in. So 
We're seeing groups try to raise member loans or capital calls at 15% interest, thereabouts. And I think, to your point, I mean, and I don't know if you remember this, but me, you, David, had a call during COVID yeah. about rescue capital because we, all three of us, thought, hey, there's going to be opportunity in this market. Oh, for sure. Let's go and get aggressive and make some deals happen. And David was and walking told me you to through. Go find them. Yeah, yeah, go find the deals, and <laughs> and you you guys were explaining to me you need to find a deal, and and rescue capital comes in, it costs twenty five percent, and you're going to do this and do that, and you're going to have to remove them as the manager. So that is really like you just explained. That is really the realities of the situation. It's not friendly money that comes in yeah. and just floats you to the other side and will accrue a hundred percent to the back end. You know, maybe Tides is going to get a, a Cinderella deal or something like the that. The bigger firms will figure it out. They'll you know, figure I mean, it out. They'll, they'll figure it out. But I think at the end of the day, you got to think about, you know, kind of like what y'all were willing to sacrifice on your first deal to get to deal 10. You know, I think a lot of people just have, like, total, like, focus on this one transaction and not going well. And I get you're a steward of people's capital and you're a fiduciary and you're all this stuff. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you can get somebody's money back on a deal and sell it today and then continue to operate other good deals better because you're not draining all your time and resources on that one deal, that's just dead. I mean, sometimes deals just die. Let them die. Well, that's, I want to ask you <laughs> the like, hard yeah. question, yeah. which is not every deal is worth saving. No. Right? And so there is cold, hard math involved to determine, okay, well, yes, we could theoretically make a capital call of X, yeah. whether it comes through a member loan or e- extra equity, whatever, right? You can, even if you can get that extra equity, is it worth it? And yeah. so I, w- I don't know if you have spent much time thinking about this. I've crunched a little bit of numbers on my end. But, you know, if you're looking at some of these, what I'm calling zombie deals, yeah. which are basically, hey, the lender's not foreclosing, which that's actually something I want to talk to you about. Yeah. Since you guys do wear your sure. debt hat, I think foreclosures would be an interesting topic because right now, by and large, lenders don't want to foreclose. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that the deal's not in trouble. That doesn't mean that the equity is not wiped out. Yeah. And so what is, do you have any math or any, like, yeah, decision-making so, process. So we've we've decided at flagship. I mean, we essentially have decided that we are not going to technically be in the rescue capital business. We're going to be in the once once whatever happens is going to happen. We're going to come with Lone Star or whoever the new sponsor is when the deal fully shakes. So if the lender takes it, we're going to invest or give a loan to the person who's going to be buying it from the lender. Or if these guys or gals sell at a 80% loss on their equity and get 20% of their money back, which is not a terrible scenario in some deals, we're going to invest with the new person who's buying that deal at that new basis. So we just decided that what the best thing for our investors' capital is, is for us to go find those deals at the reset basis and not spend a ton of time trying to figure out how to get into existing partnerships, because that is so hard to do when you actually try and get into it. And we've done it in the past. And just per hour, we're trying to think of the most efficient way for us to invest you know, our investors' capital, and that's just to sit back and wait for these things to kind of shake how they're going to shake. And I think there's going to be so many, you know, opportunities on the upswing to buy deals and just not have to deal with the existing partnership. Because um, it's just not, again, on a per hour basis, we as flagship have decided that that's just not a good use of our money. So it's great that you're not chasing it, and I don't think, we've talked about this, it's just chasing, you know, good money with bad potentially, yeah. right? It, if you were consulting someone to kind of, I guess, say yes to a situation to kind of give a capital infusion, what would be the parameters necessary for you to feel comfortable to want to do that? Because I think a lot of people are experiencing that right now. And as Rob said, a lot of people are in denial or too late on this or, uh, you know, have have delayed their process. So what what would that look like for, for, for you? It's a tough decision for sure. And I think that, you know, there's two things that I always tell people is one, if you contribute your money, will there be enough money to get the deal over the top? Because what you don't want to do is contribute capital and then that capital will be wasted because nobody else showed up and something happens to that money. So that's kind of step one. Step two is, do you want to own this asset in five years? Because if you think that you're going to put money into a deal and you're going to get that money and your original money back in the next 12 or 24 months, that's a total fallacy. I think you need to be willing to stay. If you think that real estate is good enough to still own it in five years, contribute if the numbers work. Um, And then the third thing I always tell people is get, get a third party opinion not from like a service, but call somebody who can objectively look at it because you are not going to look at that deal in an objective manner. You're so emotionally tied in that deal and you're thinking about your kids, your wife, your business, money lost, all this other, you know, 
stuff. And I cannot tell you, we have a lot of our investors uh, that are getting capital called on other deals that are asking us for advice. Because uh, we're one of their few alternative investment advisors that are still distributing money and not asking for money. Right, right. And so they're coming to us and they're nice saying- Nice place to be, by the way. It is. It, yes. um, and so they're asking us like, can you, do you mind looking at this deal? We have to be very careful. You know, we don't want to know the deal. We don't know who, we don't want to know who it is. I just say, give me the numbers redacted and I'll just give you an opinion on it. Because I don't want to like crap on somebody's deal or get in some legal snafu or something like that. So I say, just take everything out, else out, send me the you know numbers on it and I'll give you two seconds on it. Yeah, it's really interesting. That speaks to the emotionality of markets. And that's the reason why cycles will never cease to exist because humans will always be emotional. For sure. And so what's fascinating is when it comes time for us to partner together and and buy a deal and go dumpster diving, as I like to say, right, that is going to be at the reset basis. But the existing ownership could theoretically could have just done a capital call and did the exact deal that we want to do. For sure. Right. But the emotional baggage associated with the drawdown on the deal is going to actually force them just to sell it, take the loss, and then here we go, step in, hopefully, and then go make money on it. So it's interesting how someone, you know, it sucks. They're selling at the exact wrong time. So to your point, you need to be prepared to hold it for five years and take a long time to build up that, rebuild that equity. But here's the, the other thing, right? And that's why I call them zombie deals, is if you do make a capital call, let's say you put in 10 million and now you need to put another 2 million. So now you're 120% in on your equity. And then in five years time, what's your return on equity? Because if it takes you five years to only finally get to a return on equity of 5%, you know, you no, might- I don't even think we're there. I think people are putting money into deals just to get it back. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of people that are saying, I know I'm gonna lose every penny if I don't put any money, but I am putting additional money in because I think if I put this additional money in, I think I can get it all back in three years. So that's what we're seeing a yeah. lot of people do. They're taking a bet to get their money back. They're not even talking returns. It's, it's scary because there's a, there's, there is something worse than losing all your money. Yeah. It's losing 120% of it because you made a capital call and it still went sideways. I agree. Yeah, and, and I guess generally speaking, I mean, it's probably a debt issue, but where did people go wrong when these deals are getting capital it's called? So It's on the buy. Right. So that's, buying, the only, yeah. that's the only fucking reason why people lose money <laughs> in real estate is because they pay too much for it on the front end. Right. I mean, operations, pandemics, bad loans, all of that is just a percentage calculation of what you bought that deal for. Right. You're either operating the deal too thick, the loan is too much leverage, the rate <clears throat> has increased too much. I mean, sure, sometimes people lose deals just because everything went wrong that was out of their control, but it's typically because the one thing that is in their control happened, they pay too much for that. Interesting. And, you know, it's funny. Everyone got really high on interest rates. Everyone wanted to get one or two deals done when it was things were tough and equity was super easy and people got sold the dream. So it's it's very challenging when that happens for sure. And, you know, we all are prisoners of the moment, unfortunately. Yeah. But it's nice to kind of be in a time right now where acquisitions are a little bit slower and things are kind of happening in real time on our end. We feel very secure. So it's nice just to be very thoughtful about what we want to do moving forward and to not get too high on the interest rate supply. Well, that's why David's perspective, our CEO, is just, I mean, he's literally, I think he's made money, a significant amount of money in every single major market cycle since 1975, you know? And so just that insight, whenever he was like, you know, me, deal guy, I was like, oh man, we need to buy, let's do this big loan, like look at these returns. And he was like, whoa, cowboy, like let's bring this down. That's why our portfolio is performing the way that it's performing is because we really didn't drink the Kool-Aid on, you know, buying deals at two caps and, you know, putting floaters on them at 85%. You know, that just, he saw that and he was like, nope, nope, nope. I mean, it was just a, a past deal and I didn't have that kind of insight which I think is you know why it's important to kind of put the people around you that you do and also that's why we invest as a fund because we're not I'm not acting like we're gonna bat a thousand on every deal but what I can guarantee is that we're gonna stay within our parameters and just law of averages is is that you're gonna have three that are home runs you're gonna have three that are gonna kind of not do at pro forma but everything else theoretically should fall within the bell curve and so that's why we don't like putting a ton of chips on one deal we do 10 to 15 deals per fund and just the way that, you know, all the books work, it's kind of like Vegas, you know, as long as you really stay. And the only time that we've not performed at what we thought we were going to, it's because we went outside of our box just, just a little bit. Unit count was higher. Vintage was older. Market demographics weren't there. Loan was outside. of It was just literally had we stuck to our deals, every deal that we stuck to our parameters on is performing within the range. And everything that we got creative on is, you know, either doing really, really great 
or it's you know a little bit below pro forma. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'm telling myself, Kent, Craig, everybody, the lessons that we're learning right now, I think we will carry with us for the rest of our lives. For sure. So I think that's super, super valuable. And I'm really excited to be able to go through this, experience it, and hopefully make the most of it. Uh, so before we go on to the next topic, I want to get the insight from you on the debt side as far as foreclosure. So we both agreed that lenders don't want these deals. Okay, why is that? Yeah. And then how do you think those issues eventually get resolved? Yeah. I mean, I think there are some lenders who that's their number one game plan is to take the asset, you know, uh, especially in the bridge space. There's a lot of operators out there that they're just loan-to-own guys. That's just what they do. Uh, on our end, you know, it's never really in the business plan to take deals back. Um, at the end of the day, you don't make as much money as you used to doing that. Um, it's, because once you get your hands on an asset, it's typically so much worse than you thought it was or what they're telling you it was. Like this deal went south 12 months ago and you're just getting the worst of it when you finally get your paws on it. Um, and so we've found that it's a lot better to be a lot more proactive with people. Um, you know, so if something isn't going well, like during COVID, we had in our fourth debt fund, I think we were 80% office and retail. So right when COVID hit, we got everybody in our conference room and um, said, what do you need? We did a lot of paying the crews. We did a lot of this, <coughs> a lot of that. And every single loan paid off in that fund. We did not lose a penny and hit our return projections because we were proactive. Uh, there was a lot of people that were playing cat and mouse and looking at their loan documents and trying to figure out how they could string people up. We're, we want y'all to pay us off. That is what we want. We do not want your asset. We do not want to you know, try and make a bunch of additional money you know, or anything like that. So we really like to work with our borrowers as much as possible. But to your point, when something's so far gone, I mean, smart people, um, we've never had to foreclose on anything in our you know, half a billion dollars of middle market loans, probably 60 or 70 deals. Um, but we have had people that said, hey, we're going to take this to market and we're going to try and sell it. But if we don't sell it, here you go. Here's the keys because we're out of money, we're out of time, we're just, we've got other stuff to focus on, we're willing to take a total L. We're going to work with you and we'll help you get management unloaded and do all that kind of stuff, which I think is important when and if you do end up giving the keys back because 10 years from now when you're trying to buy another deal and they see a foreclosure and they put flagship capital in their phone number, they're going to call us and we're going to tell that person how you operated during that takeover and that process. And that's really important for your future career if you do end up giving something back. But Luckily for us, all the deals have sold and we've gotten you know, our money fully repatriated. So I think really just being proactive instead of being coy and clever and you know, uh, absent and kind of, I think the more proactive that you can be um, is better from a lending side uh, than trying to string people up and take the asset back. Um, and in today's world, I mean, I don't know if y'all know your bankers or your lenders, a lot of those people are not cut out to operate real estate and they know. It. And so I think that's why a lot of them, if it's a nice asset, a nice deal, they're going to take it in two seconds. You Especially know, if their base is good. For sure. And so that's the game. Uh, but if it's one that they don't want, I think that's a lot of times why people are kind of willing to talk and work things out because I, I know how hard it is to operate these deals and y'all sure as hell do. And a lot of these people that are wearing suit and ties in these offices, like they don't want to go down to Southwest Houston and go try and figure it out and sell that deal. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that's the interesting issue that, and you, understand the mechanisms happening behind the scenes at these yeah. debt shops more than I do. But when the collateral is not even worth the loan amount, that's when a foreclosure is very tricky for the lender. If, if the lender's sitting at 50%, then they'll take it all day because they know they can deal with the issue and then get out, yeah. right? So because values have come in so much and lenders are now over levered, uh, can you explain what the process is of uh, this isn't I don't think really an issue no, that but you guys have yeah. yeah yeah but especially these CLO shops what does it look like on their end if they take back a deal and then they have to kind of re-rate their portfolio and then their line of credit comes yeah. into question how does that whole thing work behind the scenes and it's such a it's not smoke and mirrors there's just so many different veils that are that are on back there so you know, depending on what your CLO shop is, a lot of them will say that they are mandated to keep like 20 to 30 percent on their balance sheet, which is totally false. Uh, the majority of them have sold off every penny of those loans that they possibly can. The ones that are on their balance sheet, 
when they do start going south, that is what's troublesome. And that's what will affect their stock price. And the analysts on Wall Street will start to really kind of hurt their, you know, their valuations. But really, on the CLO side, it's really in the servicer's hands. And at the end of the day, what the servicers are really good at are not being responsive. And I don't know if y'all have ever been in that situation, but there's a reason why they gave you a 1-800 number in St. Paul and it's Midland or Wells Fargo or whatever it is. And I don't know if this is like an industry thing that they do this, but I really do think that they make it as hard as possible to work things out and it just makes you want to pay them off or get rid of them or sell the asset. Mm-hmm. Um, because these workout groups, I mean, they, they, they take forever to work things out and that's what kills a real estate deal is not being able to move. If you can't sell the deal or you can't draw down on, you know, draws for renovations or you can't get access to the interest reserve or you can only, like there's some shops that they only let you pay them off on three days a month. And if you don't pay them off on those three days, you have to wait another 30 days. I mean, it's just, it's so ridiculous all the things that they have to do. So I think in today's market, a lot of these CLO lenders are adding additional capital to their balance sheets to kind of shore up the issues that they're having. And... They're really trying to work out as much as they can. I'm sure y'all are hearing it, but we know of a lot of bridge lenders that are working really well with borrowers right now. Because essentially every single borrower that took a bridge loan in the past 36 months is in breach of their covenants. This is a fact. For sure. I mean, so if they wanted foreclose, they could pick, you know, item one through 20. DSCR, loan out of balance. Whatever. I mean, everybody, it's just one through 20. I bet eight out of the 20 people are already, so they could have already moved on it. Um, But when they start doing that, it starts to trigger some things on the back end with their lenders and everything. And then it brings in regulators to come look at their books and they're probably not going to like what they find. And so I think a lot of people are really, unfortunately, just kind of pushing the issue down the road. Um, And I think that road's really long. And I think a lot of people are hoping that it's really short. And who knows, maybe some geopolitical stuff like it's happening right now, or maybe something at the you know government level will end up coming in and saving the day. Um, I think the election next year is really interesting on timing. Um, but I don't know. I think it could be like this for 12 or 24 more months. And so if you're continuing to kick the can, at some point it's got to capitulate. Um, and so we'll see. But those guys, I guess in theory, are a lot smarter than we are and they're managing billions of dollars. So I think right now it's just a lot of capital transference between their lender to new capital to their getting rescue capital from foreign dollars to where they only have to make 4% from some big pension fund or, you know, whatever it is. It's just when the dollar amounts get that large, a lot more flexibility can happen and there's a lot more handshake deals that are going on. And to that point, all the people that are like, I want to go buy loans, you know, we're not going to see a single damn loan at our level. Yeah. All of the all of those loans will trade C-suite to C-suite. You know, you saw it on a lot of the major banks throughout the country whenever they had bad loan books. I mean, that stuff traded at ridiculous numbers top to top. I mean, it's never going to feather down to, you know, guys like us walking to some regional bank and getting a good 200-unit multifamily deal at $60. You know, it's just no. it's not going to happen. So... Switching gears and changing questions now. As the cycle turns, what are you going to pivot and focus to? So, is there anything specific that you, you know, from an asset class that you like more, and, yeah. and anything that you don't like? So, kind of walk us through how you, you know, analyze and view the marketplace. Yeah. So, we're raising money right now for our new uh, strategic real estate capital fund. Uh, the focus of that fund is going to be just what we've been talking about. It's going to be deals that are good assets to where the borrowers were, or the general partners were good to good-ish general partners, and they were just victims of circumstance. You know, got a floater at a big valuation, so their debt service tripled. Taxes totally screwed them. Insurance totally screwed them. Rents probably flat, bad debt and delinquencies increase. You know, and so if all those things happen, your valuation can drop 30 to 50% on a deal. Um, and I don't think we're going to get any 50% valuation deals drops. Um, but I do think that we're going to be heavy in the hunt for good assets that were victims of circumstance. I'm not terribly interested in deals that are hyper distressed because they were terrible general partners and they did everything else wrong. Uh, I think that there's some people that are willing to do that and maybe they can get the deal for 10 or 15 K less a door, but I just, I don't think that time value of money is there. Um, to have to really dig that deal out of that big of a ditch. 
Um, so we're focused all over the country. Right now, as we sit today, I think Flagship has 26 investments from Portland to Miami. Uh, we're making a heavy focus into um, still kind of 1970s to early 90s vintage deals. Everybody that I've been talking to has said that they've wanted to get out of the 1960s to 1980s space, which I think is good because that just leaves more for me to go get. Um, right. And we're focusing heavy, heavily on the South. We know the South probably better than most out there. So I think I consider that kind of, you know, Reno to Miami. So if you kind of just go Reno over and down. And then I've been uh, in the past three months, I've been in Salt Lake City, Denver, Nashville, Charlotte, Atlanta, um, really focusing on kind of those are markets that we don't have a heavy presence in really like Salt Lake, really like Charlotte and a lot of those kind of metros surrounding those areas. And I love Atlanta. I think one of the biggest resets in the country, I think is going to be in Atlanta. Um, and so I've got a real heavy focus on the Atlanta. MSA. Is that because of collection issues or supply? I think it's because of collection issues. I think that the, one of the largest run-ups and valuations in the country was in the Atlanta Metro and those demographics cannot support those values. Yeah, very true. It's just, we, That's how we feel about Phoenix. Frankly. Well, yeah, Phoenix has more of a supply issue than a collection issue. For sure, issue. and I'd love to hop back into Phoenix. We made a ton of money when rates were low in Phoenix, and the valuations on some of those deals are 50% below. And I would yeah. love to get back into Phoenix at a real at a adjusted basis. But we used to own 10,000 units in Atlanta, and we know what those, what those deals look like, how they operate, what the demographics look like. And I think that the Atlanta Metro was a real COVID wave rider from a rental assistance perspective. And when that rental assistance went away, I mean, people were buying 1980s deals there for 130 a door. Those things are worth 65 a door. I mean, I'm not kidding. Um, in, in bad parts of Atlanta. And I just think that's gonna be one of the most surprising, that's my crystal ball prediction, is that I think Atlanta is going to be one of the biggest reset markets from a cap rate and per unit perspective. So, so you're interested in maybe in a couple of years, maybe 18 months from now, redeploying equity into that market, For correct? Sure. Or 12. Gotcha. And I'd really like, love that market at the right number. Right. And then what markets, with that said, are you not willing to touch? Because you just mentioned from Portland to Miami. So you are as market agnostic yeah. as they could possibly come. So yeah. Portland, I mean, it's funny, investing in Oregon said no one ever, especially in this space. That's funny. And I have a lot of experience in Oregon. It's as blue as blue can be. It's about as blue as my eyes or as blue as that water. <laughs> that, bl- you know, that, that, was a, that was a COVID, that was yeah. a COVID uh, deal. And oddly enough, in that state, you can raise rents tied to inflation. So we could raise rents however high, high we wanted to. I think it was inflation plus 7%. Um, so that was the only reason we bought that deal cheap. But um, no, we're not doing California. We're not doing blue states. Um, we are, you know, until valuations come down, I don't know if I'm terribly interested in like major, major metros. And that can, can, that can include Atlanta proper. That can include Houston proper, Dallas proper, Austin, Charlotte, I like a lot of the surrounding metros around there because I think the pricing is going to adjust quicker there. But until, I mean, I was in Charlotte last week. I mean, there's still do, deals there trading at four caps. Right. No so with caps are right now, how much more of expansion or dropping of evaluation do you need to feel very comfortable with getting in and not to put crystal ball you again because you already gave us a very hot yeah, yeah. and great take there. But tentatively speaking, when do you think uh, the equity deployment will uh, re-began in, you know, the set of markets that you feel very good about. Yeah. Um, so on the cap rate side, I mean, the deals that we are seeing that are real out there, they're five and a half, six years caps on true numbers. And those are just not very many. There's might be five of those out there in the country right now. Um, so I think, you know, there always just needs, I think positive leverage is the game. So if you're getting money from the agencies at 6%, you really got to be buying close to that on tax adjusted numbers. Um, maybe a little bit inside of that if you really like the asset in the market. Um, and then I really think that the world turns on. I mean, literally in the past 90 days, our pipeline has exponentially gone up. Like, for example, I talked to a guy in Houston yesterday who I trust probably more than anybody from an operation side, not because I don't trust y'all, but I mean, this guy's got like, they had 10,000 units in Texas. They sold 4,000 when rates were low, made a fortune, still have 6,000 in their operations, all C stuff. Calkin? No, no, I'm kidding. Um, Applewood? Yeah, no, 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 none of those high hitters. Uh, so, like, I trust this guy. And he's this is a great example, of kind of where the market is. So he said, twelve months ago, he was at about fifty percent of the whisper on deals, and then nine months ago, he was about seventy percent of the whisper, and then four or five months ago, he was like 
80% of the whisper. And then I talked to him literally th two weeks ago before I was going to Charlotte and he said they have five deals under contract in Houston. And so I think that just shows the progression of where things are going. And they are market buyers. They have a huge management operation. Like they know what they're doing. And for somebody who knows what they're doing to have four deals under contract, gives me a lot of hope and confidence because I think I think that that means that sellers are finally starting to give. And I bet they didn't rake those sellers totally over the coals. I bet they just said, "Here's the number. Here's the number. Here's the number. Here's the number." And then it just slowly kind of got there. And so I think that you know, even as people are working out their loans and trying to figure stuff out, I think I think NMHC this year is going to be an absolute just festival. Uh, of that is my least favorite conference, but I, know. I, I, I hate that conference. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, Sorry. I, I, I totally hater, get it, but I, but I think that that's, it's going to be so many people that are going to be literally about to collapse and die. Yes. Yeah. There's going to be so many people that have so much pent up capital for deals like that. And there's going to be so many brokers that are going to be so broke. <laughs> that haven't sold a deal in 24 months, even broker. though they made a fortune the past five years, so they're going to be fine. So they you know, a broken broker, right? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but like literally, they're just. I just think it's going to be the perfect storm. Like I think deals get done on the table in NMHC this year. Yeah, dead serious. People are going to show up. I think somebody's going to show up, and he's going to be totally blowing smoke, and somebody's going to say, "What's the number?" And they're going to. It's going to. It's going it to. It's going to happen right there. And I yeah. think that the capital markets, we're going to know where rates are, hopefully. Uh, you yeah. know, as far as increases and decreases, I think it's going to be flat. So the agencies are going to say it is 2024, here's spreads, go. And there's not going to be a lot of movement in that probably for a year. Well, it's good for, I mean, velocity will happen once things stabilize, right? Or at least... Yeah. we've got to know what interest rates are before you can start buying deals. Right, right. And so that's really what I think turns it on, is I think that everybody tries to work... People who will have wanted to try and fix their issue or their problem child will have already tried to do so and either been successful or unsuccessful, I think, by early 2020. And gotcha. I think the capital markets will stabilize. And then I think it's going to not be the volume that we saw when rates were low, but I think the deals are going to slowly start. Right. So then asset class-wise, only multifamily you're looking to no, do? No, we'll do alternatives. Yeah. yeah. So we've got, um, in our first fund, we have two office buildings and one flex industrial deal. That was back when you could buy commercial deals at nine caps and finance them at four. You know, and so those deals have been ginning, you know, eight to fourteen percent cash on cash distribution starts. We like those, yeah. Yeah, we do too. They're not yeah. out there anymore. Yeah. Uh, and so we closed an industrial deal in Houston, um, hundred percent occupied, bought it on a eight and a half cap, financed it in the low sevens with a regional bank. Um, so that deal's already distributing to the fund. So we'll look at some flex industrial office. I'm not there yet on the equity side. I'm quoting office deals on the debt side. Um, and really like that, you know, but that's at you know, there's a deal that we looked at that was out in the market for 30 million. Group now has it under contract, I think, for 20. They asked us for a $10 million loan. Yeah. What are asset classes that you, if you see it come through, you'll automatically delete the email? Like, you just will not look at it or touch it? Uh, probably not. Um, assisted living stuff. That's just, you know, assisted living is really hard just because there's such an operational business component to that with a lot of account receivables and, you know, healthcare and you know that kind of stuff that I just frankly don't think is good use of our time to try and figure out probably could um, and I mean tell you the truth we've looked at everything I mean uh, hotels don't scare me retail doesn't scare me office doesn't scare me on the debt side I won't look at an office deal on the on the equity right. side um, but I like neighborhood strip retail I really like flex industrial kind of that old flex industrial kind of 70s to 90s product that is just on a ton of land um, like our deal in Houston's on seven acres inside the loop, you know, so it's wow. really hard to lose money <clears throat> on that kind of dirt. Um, but the heavy focus is multifamily because I really think that's, I think for commercial stuff, it's been a bad story for a long time, right? Um, and so those, I don't think there's a ton of, other than office space, I don't think there's going to be a ton of opportunity for like a big reset basis on a lot of that stuff. Um, on the multifamily side, I think we're going to be able to get some deals, which is why we're raising the new fund. To, to go after that. So if, and with that said, with the fund, you know, if you, let's say you've had a you know, round number, just call it $100 million you raise. Yeah. Where would you deploy that, you know, on a pie chart percentage wise? Where would you put, you know, multifamily office? Multifamily, 20% alternative. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, very we wouldn't cool. do more than 20% in non-multifamily. So you said something very interesting about secondary markets. Yeah. And you feel like that's where you feel better about pricing right now. For sure. I almost feel like well, it's, it's interesting because if you compare, if I'm looking at my maps here, yeah. DFW versus Houston and San Antonio, 
DFW is nuts still. 20 bids, very competitive, pricing still yeah. kind of around fives or below. But Houston, San Antonio, we're seeing cap rates almost, I mean, breach six, frankly. Yeah. We're going to start seeing that. So I think when it comes to, I guess, those three examples, I do agree with you that, yeah, I feel much more comfortable right now buying in San Antonio versus Houston, where For I sure. feel like the basis has reset earlier and more than DFW, right? If, if someone's buying in Dallas right now and they're bragging to me about a 15, 20% discount, it's not enough. No. It's just not totally there. Agree. So, but then do you agree with that same idea if we're talking about Lubbock oh, or, yeah. you know, I'm saying tertiary, out? like, oh, what's a good example? Um, like Longview and Tyler. No, 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 you're, you're saying Texas tertiary. That's okay. like small town. I'm saying... Kennesaw, Georgia, uh, Greensboro, you know, those kind of markets to where we kind of call them the spokes of a major metro. So gotcha. in the middle of nowhere, not a chance. I mean, that's just a, your, <laughs> your yield has to be so good Sir, there yeah. to that's, where you're, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I really like the, we've got deals in Macon, Georgia, Columbus, Georgia, that are, you know, anywhere from 45 to 90 miles outside of a major metro. Um, and those deals... Frankly, we're making those decisions based on performance. So a lot of those deals in those tertiary markets, a lot of those folks are working and wages are going up. And, you know, in the city, there's just a lot of other options. Um, and so we're just seeing it right now. Our tertiary market portfolio is performing better than a lot of our major metro stuff. Um, and that might change, but we don't see the economy technically getting any better anytime soon. Um, and so, I don't know. I feel like, of course, you want to be in Houston or you want to be in Atlanta proper. Um, but that's at the right price. Again, it goes down to, I mean, everything's relative to, you know, kind of what your yield is. And we're just seeing a lot better yield. Like we're getting like $1,200 rents and, you know, Macon and Columbus, whereas that's, you're getting 1300 in parts of Atlanta. And I promise you we paid a lot less for, yeah, you half know, as much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, literally our, bought a deal in Macon, I think at like 57 a door. Columbus deal was like, 72 a door um and the rents are not that far off um and frankly the tenants are better right <laughs> so, yeah i mean it's it's just <laughs> yeah I don't so know, it, literally everything about the deal is better yeah, yeah i mean but, but that could change and i think you're not going to get the same vault and never get the same cap yeah. yeah you're not going to get the same vault but i mean caps might not be the jam here pretty soon you know i think it's gonna be cash flow um, yeah. and with so. that yeah and what said what would it take for you to want to deploy equity right now in the environment today would you need positive leverage if so how much occupancy you know uh, yeah. what, what what would you need i guess from uh, on that side to well, make you feel comfortable loan at three yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, percent you know to kind of start um yeah, which but, we did, but, we, but today's basis yeah, yeah, yeah but we just did we did have one of those recently um but no i mean i think you know net leverage is what you're going to get i mean i just think that the market's too efficient right now uh yes there's too many people that are chasing deals so i think kind of net leverage is excellent if there's upside true upside um and that net leverage is tax adjusted just rip your face off insurance you know <laughs> increase in bad debt and delinquencies like you're underwriting net leverage is a good market deal that i would invest in today um i think occupancies needs to be no lower than 87 percent i don't know why i have that number in my head but i always have i just feel like once it tips over that it never gets back above it um so i kind of like 87 to you know 92 percent which i think kind of 92 percent occupancy is the new 95. um and really i think will need for me on my underwriting to see some type of distribution to the partners within 12 months so there needs to be that's that net leverage part where you really think like right. you know once you get in there get under the hood clean it up roll out some tenants start to show a little bit like i don't need 10 percent, but i need you know something coming back to the fund as a distribution hopefully within 12 months yeah we i mean we fell victim to the market uh before and we kind of didn't care about year one yield no right and now today it's very serious to us and we want you know maybe four percent yeah year one and then but say two yeah yeah yeah, yeah and then we want to get to you know we want year two to be six yeah. seven and we're all working off the treasury right now and the risk-free rate and you know to take no risk to make five or you know six percent right now on your money that's what we're selling against right now ultimately if you're really sophisticated is what that looks like at least for the interim until you know, if, if you're a people are like, well, I'll just wait until this bottoms out. If this bottoms out in two years, fine. I'll make 6% of my money all day long. Yeah. But am I going to take a risk to be at 
the guy that's the really the last one holding the bag, uh-uh, not going to do that. So that's what really what a lot of things we're selling with right now, which is challenging on my end when I'm calling and you know trying to find the equity for these deals. That's when we talk to someone that's actually smart. That's what they're saying. Yeah, I mean we we we're raising 150 million dollars right now from some pretty smart people, and I just tell them I'm like, you want to go make six percent? Good luck. Go get it. It's all yeah. you. You know, we're going to try and make triple that. Yeah. So. It's just an allocation. I mean, I can, sure, I've got a bunch of money in 6% stuff, and but my money that I've got in my deals, I'm not trying to make six. You know, it's, I've really just, I love when people tell me that. I'm like, why'd you take the damn call? <laughs> yeah. Like, I went, great, you read the Wall Street Journal yesterday, congrats. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, it's like, it's not, like, they're, the people that want to invest in real estate that we're raising money for, I've never seen them this excited in the past 12 years I've been in the industry. And I'm incredibly excited as well. We talk about this all the time. Like, we're giddy. We don't want anyone to lose money, of course, but that just, hey, it sucks to say. It just is what it is. No, it, for sure. it, it's unfortunate, but we're really looking forward to, on our end, the discipline and the discretion that we had to not buy everything, to stay true to our numbers, for sure. to not get too high, to scale the company correctly, to move forward. It gets us really jazzed up, so we're excited. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a once in a generational, we think, hit flagship opportunity. So, for a lot of our investors that have invested well over the past 15 years, we're telling them this is right now is the time Double down. To, to put your biggest bet on the yeah. table. Because we think this is very going to be re very reminiscent of the early 90s, the early 80s, the great financial crisis. We think that type of opportunity is about to be here, and we think it's going to be a very finite window. And is that also, would you say more so, considering the debt situation, it's more consolidated to real estate more than ever before? Or is it just due to, you know, just timing? No, I mean, I think it's, there was just so many things that were thrown into the pot. You know, I mean, the interest rates could have caused something pretty special from an opportunity standpoint, but it was, you know, 25% of every dollar that's in your wallet's been printed in the past four years. I mean, that's a once in a generation type event. COVID's a once in a generation type event. Yeah. Um, you know, there's just a lot of really really, really black swan e kind of things that are happening at once. And so the thought is, it's kind of like at the beginning of COVID. You can either think that all of these things are going to kind of like net out and then it's just going to be kind of be a smooth landing, or you just think that it's going to be a very, very, you know, fast moving object that's going to meet an immovable object. Right. And there's going to be an explosion. Um, and so we think that there's going to be something that is going to shake loose. And that's why with our next fund, we're not raising a debt or an equity fund. We're just raising a strategic capital fund. So if the opportunity is the debt, we'll do all debt. If it's equity, we'll do all equity. Um, if we just think there's going to be a need for capital. Really don't know what that's going to be at this point. We don't know where it's going to be exactly. We just know there's going to be a need for new capital. And so we want to have that war chest ready to deploy quickly. But I think it's only going to be 8 to 16 months. And then after that, Blackstone's going to come in and just buy it all or do all the debt. Or, I mean, it's just like for yeah. middle market stuff, you only have a very finite window to right. kind of that do alpha. it. Yeah. yeah, to get it because the market's too efficient. There's too many people that want to invest in multifamily these days. And right. so we want to, you can't be looking for deals and trying to raise the capital. We want to raise the capital and then have the deals there. Yeah, you're getting your ducks in a row and, and getting that all sorted out. So, so, speaking of once in a generational opportunity, what advice would you give us to prepare? Yeah. Um, I would. Right now is the time to build on relationships, both on the capital side and do everything that you can that doesn't involve the deal, is what I'm telling people. So the guy who's told you no 10,000 times that you know could cut a check for $20 million, like it is time to drive to upstate New York and go and see him, you know? And with no mission, with no ask, with just right. a, hey, we are here, we think it's coming, here's our business plan, let me know if you have any questions. I mean, and for me, the capital raising side is we're pretty good there. But for me, like that's why I've been in literally, I think I've been in every single major metro in the United States this year, meeting with brokers, meeting with guys that own real estate saying, Hey, we are a capital provider calls and there's no live deals. There's no event. I'm just going to every market, just saying hi to the brokers. Right. And just, I think this is the time because the, I think the deals are not going to get done based on volume and numbers. The deals that are going to get done are going to get done on relationships. When this thing starts to really shake, the broker isn't going to take a deal to market when somebody's losing all their money. They're going to call the two people that can make it the easiest transaction for them to get paid. 
and I want to be yeah. involved in that behind the scenes process and not, you know, some schmuck that's number 20 on a call sheet on a call for offers kind of thing. We're already getting those calls where yeah. broker calls us up and says, hey, the seller remembers you did well for them on yeah. this deal. They liked working with you. They have a problem. Can you solve it? And it's still early in the game, so the valuations aren't quite there yet. The pain's not quite there yet, but we look forward to getting those calls and being able to act on them and uh, and being that strategic buyer. That's what's going to create the big opportunity. So a similar question is uh, to your competitors, your fellow capital providers in the space, You know, whether it be a family office yeah. or a you know, middle market PE fund, what advice do you have for them as far as their legacy assets and also for putting out new money? I mean, I know you don't, they're your competitors, yeah, yeah. but... I think, I think the biggest problem that people are going to have is making a decision on when to act. And that's why we've been so successful is that we're always investing in real estate. We don't care what's going on. These family offices and institutions, they're always waiting for the perfect moment to strike where the numbers are just right, but the market's too efficient. You're never going to hit that. Um, and so I always tell people, you know, like the biggest problem that a lot of these people who have a ton of money is that the deal is, is whenever you have 20% of the information, it's not enough. But when you have 80%, it's too late. The deal's already done and you're going to miss the opportunity. And so for them, I think they just have analysis paralysis. I think that's going to be their biggest issues. They're going to think, don't catch a falling knife. Wait, wait, wait. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Everybody that said that during COVID didn't buy a single deal at the right time. And they ended up paying 30% more nine months later. And if that's their deal and they have cheap capital and they only need to make an eight, wait all you want and let everybody else figure out all the hard stuff and then catch it as it's already kind of going. But I think that's going to be the biggest issue for family offices is their appetite for risk and being able to make the decisions at the most opportune time, which there's never the most opportune time. You just need to always be investing. You're going to catch them on the way up and catch them on the way down. Awesome. Any final thoughts on your end? No, I thought that was great uh, advice at the, at the end there and great conversation as always. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a very fun dinner tonight at a very special restaurant uh, in New York City. We're going to go to, to Carbone tonight and uh, eat our way in pasta. So we're very excited about that. Thank you so much for listening. And once again, thank you so much for coming here. And we get to see you very shortly at our event coming up. This will probably be posted the week or the day of the event. Uh, did you have something to say? Yeah, I just want, I mean, after all the amazing stuff that JC said, I want to give you the opportunity to let people know yes. uh, where to learn more about Flagship yeah. and to invest with you flood guys. your inbox with more deal yeah, flow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think it's flagshipco.com. I've never even told anybody our website, I don't think. Uh, I'm more of a business card guy. But um, no, flagshipco.com. Um, happy to give Rob and Craig all my uh, information for y'all to send out to anybody. Any capital needs, we're happy to provide information um, on what we're doing or give you a little insight into the markets that we're into. And then we'll be at the Lone Star Conference, um, what, a week from today? That's right. Yeah. 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 So I'll be speaking there and uh, that'll probably be a good opportunity too, if you're coming or you want to come to pin me down, because as y'all know, I'm on a plane a lot and pretty hard to schedule. So yeah. uh, if you want to come see me, come to New York next week. And for those who are listening and putting the time in, why don't you right now once more to say in a perfect world, if you can find me this deal and you're not the first time, but maybe your second or third or somewhere between the two and the 10, as you alluded to, what would you ideally like to find from a deal, yeah. you an account, vintage, the whole nine, just so they could best help that out. For sure. Uh, and yeah, why don't you walk us through that real quick? Yeah. Well, cheap plug. I like it. Um, so 50 to 250 units anywhere in the South. Uh, 1960s needs to have pitched roofs. Um, 60s to early 2000s vintage. Chillers don't scare you? Not an issue. I mean, I think a lot of the deals that have gone through so many value adds lately, a lot of the heavy cap X work has been done. But I mean, we're not going to go into a deal with bad pipes or, you know, real issues mm -hmm. there. Uh, and that goes to our, my next point, which is the cap X. We like to do kind of 5 to 15K on the interiors. So I think all in on a cap X budget, we don't like to be over 20 a door. Um, three to five year hold investment. We're looking for a 15% net IRR to flagship at the end of the day. Um, and our structures are prep money back in a waterfall. So pretty straightforward. Straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And then yeah, you give us a credit if you reach out, of course, so they know, but I'm sure it'll be figured <laughs> out one way or another. Well, once again, thank you so much. Episode 17 of the Capital Spotlight podcast. We will catch you next week.